Dr. Mark Rossellini, has given us the honor of announcing his last 10 years of research exclusively for the Monte Carlo Anti-Aging Conference. And indeed, it is even four years ahead of publication. His concepts and insight make him one of the foremost neuroscientists in the world today. Please listen carefully to his revolutionary information, which is at least 15 years ahead of mainstream medicine. He rarely lectures, so please give him a warm welcome, Dr. Mark Rossellini. Thank you. <clears throat> Phil makes me pay him 500 francs every time he says these nice things about me, so uh, I appreciate it. Uh, this is my first anti-aging convention to uh, speak at. And usually, I work in the elite sports medicine industry, and uh, so a lot of the things, the conventions I speak at are uh, for athletes and also celebrities, because we do quite a bit of work with uh, celebrities. And it seems like those conventions, it's always uh, how young everybody is and who their latest plastic surgeon is, you know. They think that's anti-aging medicine. Uh, I noticed at this convention, uh, all the doctors I've met, they, they gleefully like to talk about how old they are and how they use hormonal therapy for internal plastic surgery. So I, I think I'm going to like this group a lot. Uh, I'll actually be 94 in June myself, so. And now actually, uh, you know, I'm just two years short of 50, so, uh, and I've been on hormone therapy myself for uh, quite a number of uh, years, so I try to practice what I preach. It's not some type of uh, study on rats that we can't apply to humans or things like that. We, we all do it ourselves, and I guess we're basically our own guinea pigs on trying a lot of these things, and sometimes with mistakes. I've got to read you this article that was a, a science article that I noted just last week. You know, there's like research articles for everything. And this was a, a research article on um, listening habits uh, in lecture type of environments such as this one. Uh, and, and based on this research article I read, I thought it's very apropos for getting ready to speak at this convention. It said, based on the study of the listening habits of people, 10% of the people in a lecture group environment uh, were 100% retentive, retained the information, and had very good recall after the uh, lecture. It said 25% of the people, they kind of listened 50% of the time. The other 50% of the time, they were thinking about what they were going to do when they got out of the lecture, uh, thinking about what kids needed to be where, you know, what have you. So about 25%, they listened 50% of the time, the other 50% of the time, they were not listening or retaining. This is what amazed me. They said the other 65% of the people did nothing during the whole lecture but sit and have sexual fantasies. <laughs> 65%, according to this research article. So I, I figure I, it doesn't matter how bad I am up here today that most of you are going to really enjoy my presentation. I mean. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, my, you know, I don't, scientists are scientists. Huh? What can I say? Uh, I presume everybody got the little presentation abstracts that we passed out. Um, and you can read kind of what I've put together there. We've been really shocked that autoimmune diseases and most uh, really chronic inflammation autoimmunity is just basically a raging out of control epidemic. And a lot of people say, well, I don't know what you're talking about when you say autoimmune diseases. We don't read a much, much about that in the newsprint. The, the problem is, you know, diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Depression is an autoimmune disease. Osteoporosis, multiple sclerosis, there's a close to 100 different autoimmune diseases. So you know, the press and the, and, the, and the medical establishment tends to want to talk about the flavor, if you will, of the autoimmune disease, as opposed to talking about autoimmune diseases. It is really one type of dysfunction taking place. And since 
in the little abstract I wrote, about 70 to 80 percent of deaths that occur every year, for example, in the United States, we had about 2.4 million deaths last year. 70 to 80 percent of those deaths are actually due to chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. You know, you may die of, of you know, complications from bacterial uh, blood poisoning or liver failure or what have you, but the underlying etiopathogenesis is chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. Um, and, and the problem in, in both the U.S. and now in Europe, because it's spreading very quickly in Europe, uh, most notably uh, in Great Britain, is that there's no central reporting and there's no central monitoring, nor is there any central consolidation of the science data uh, as it regards to chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. You know, again, it's, it's all broken out and fragmented between the various types of diseases. And when you have chronic inflammation and autoimmunity, it's not uncommon to have uh, six to eight different types of diseases going on at once. So a person with a neurodegenerative disease such as multiple sclerosis, they have many other actually identifiable uh, autoimmune diseases going on internally. And this makes it difficult to treat because you know you, you treat something that will help the the nerve damage that's going on and then you end up causing toxicity problems to a liver that's already in trouble for example um, so what i'm going to do is talk about I'm gonna, we've, what we've done is we've consolidated all this information into one arena and then we've been able to locate really the central tendencies that we see taking place in all these diseases and so what I'll try to adjudicate to you is, is what those, those central tendencies we're seeing are as far as um, where we see dysfunction in the endocrine system, uh, and then specifically what we can do about stopping those dysfunctions. So unfortunately, I'll have to take you through a little bit of uh, academic science, if you will. There, and there won't be any pop quiz after, the, after I'm finished. And then I'll show you exactly what to do about uh, some of these problems. In the abstract, I also showed you what uh, some of the top experts in the Center for Disease Control are saying about this epidemic. I mean, we already know uh, that we're in big trouble. Uh, and the problem is because medicine tends to want to look at a symptom and then prescribe a drug to stop that symptom, for example, inflammation, uh, it's result, or, uh, for example, excess stomach acid, which is a rampant problem. Uh, it ends up, because we're only looking at one piece of the body, that the t 12 of the top 20 selling drugs in the United States actually directly and specifically contribute to autoimmunity and cause autoimmune diseases. Um, and so as we continue to go down the road of prescribing a pharmaceutical, for a specific symptom, we're missing the larger picture and we're actually creating even worse autoimmune diseases. And a perfect example is obesity and diabetes. They're both rampant, out of control. We've never seen anything like it since 1980. It's just been unbelievable. Well, if you recorrelate those lines and look at the amount of anti-inflammatory drugs that have been utilized since 1980, those lines are very directly correlated and I'll show you why that's happening. Also, when we test, we started cell, cellular testing people in 1995. Uh, and so what we do is instead of just doing a quick blood test, we cellular test, we take your blood and test what's happening at the cellular level. And we look at the body on, on a whole basis. And this yields some very different results than what even the medical textbooks say, because again, we're looking at the whole body. We're looking at the whole endocrine system, not just the thyroid or the growth hormone. And we were just uh, really shocked in what we, we saw. Uh, so shocked that we weren't sure our testing was right. Even though we've used whole body kinetics, uh, cellular testing in elite athletes, like Olympic athletes and professional athletes, for 20 years, we had not used them on normal humans, okay? Uh, athletes are a very uh, different breed. Their metabolisms are t totally superior to a normal person. Uh, they're better than doing rat studies, okay? I don't understand what rats have to do with people, but, uh, 
but they, uh, they are different. So we've had to re-correlate that data down to normal people like ourselves. And we have just been shocked at what we've seen. And so we've been looking, and I'll show you, um, to find the, 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 basically what is the thing, if you will, that is causing this rampant dismodulation in the neural endocrine system. I mean, there's got to be a source of where this is coming from. And there's many theories as far as what causes what we look at is early onset aging. This is where I have 30-year-olds that we biomarker their endocrine system, for example, and they show that they internally have an age of 70 to 80 years old. Uh, and again, we, were, we went three years from 95 to 98 wondering whether we had a clue what we were doing because these tests were coming back this bad. And by 98, we realized the tests were extremely accurate. And in fact, we had this kind of problem going on. And it's, it's a, now it's a very common occurrence to test people between 28 and 40 years old, uh, which is the number one age bracket that autoimmune diseases affect. Uh, and it's a weekly occurrence that we'll find 28, 30, 35 year old men or women with internal aging biomarkers of 70 to 85 years old. Uh, and it's like, oh, gee, what are we gonna do? And so, anyway, let me go through this. When we look at autoimmune diseases, these are the alterations that we see. And as you can notice, there's quite a few of them. It's kind of, and, and the reason I'm showing you this is one, to show you what's happening internally, and two, to hopefully you will appreciate that a single drug or a single supplement will not correct these types of abnormalities. Um, and we're all human. You know, we should have started taking antioxidants when we were 25 or 30. We should have started taking uh, hormones to help our body modulate better and slow down aging around 30. But, you know, when you feel good and you're doing well in life, you won't tend to do that. So by the time you get into a systemic autoimmune disease, you've had it for seven to 10 years. It's a slow moving type of dysfunction. So by the time even you show a blood test that, that starts looking irregular, you're already seven to 10 years into this disease. And what we found is that when you've had the disease for eight to 12 years, because of the remodeling that takes place in the body, they get extremely difficult to beat and they take multimodal protocols to beat. So one of the reasons for showing you this is to hopefully you can appreciate that it, there's no single bullet that's ever gonna be available to get these diseases under control. But there are clearly things that we can do, which I will show you, that will get these diseases into manageable, manageable remission. Some of the changes we see and some of the big ones is ANS is autonomic nervous system. You have a central peripheral autonomic and something called an enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system is what controls your gastrointestinal tract. What we see is a loss of what we call sympathetic drive or stimulant drive internally in the body. And the body becomes more parasympathetic, like antidepressants or parasympathetic type of drug. We also see the body becomes more anaerobic in its oxidation. Aerobic means you're creating energy, you're using oxygen. Antioxidants affect aerobic metabolism. So this would be like runners that have a lot of aerobic metabolism. But what we see is the body starts going anaerobic, which means it's, it's not using the Krebs cycle, it's, it's using another cycle. And the anaerobic predominance starts feeding the immune system. We also see that there's a large increase in stress hormones, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and stre the two main stress hormones are growth hormone and cortisol. And it's interesting, in the mainstream medicine, they use cortisol very aggressively to control inflammation and things like that. In the uh, anti-aging alternative, quote unquote, side, we tend to poo-poo cortisol. Uh, so there's a large difference in how we view cortisol. Uh, same thing with growth hormone. Uh, the number one question I'm asked is how can people that have these horrible internal degenerative diseases, whether it's more noted diseases like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, 
uh, or Lou Gehrig's diseases, but these people look fantastic. I mean, they, they just look great. Uh, and many times their blood tests are totally normal because blood tests only pick up late stage systemic diseases. And these are slow moving internal degenerative diseases. And so I've always asked, you know, why do you look so good? I mean, you've got a disease that's totally destroying your autonomic nervous system and all your organs very aggressively. And the quick answer is it's because of growth hormone. Not that I use it. We actually antagonize growth hormone pretty aggressively, and I'll tell you why. Uh, as the body starts generating a lot of internal damage, it will generate growth hormone to protect nerves, organs, uh, and actually repair the GI tract. But, but excess growth hormone, it may look, make you look fantastic and your skin tight, but it really destroys your metabolism internally. So there's clearly a balance that has to take place there that happens. The next thing we see is a large increase in the size of the immune system. And there's a lot of theories about what causes aging, okay? And we're almost to, I think, to the point that we believe the increase that we see in the immune, the size of the immune system, and the IRP is the amount of immunoreactive proteins, it is progressively getting larger as we age. Why? Because we're losing the hormones that help control it. More importantly, we lose our metabolism. The immune system uses a massive amount of ATP and it's active at night, not during the day. Uh, and so you burn about 80% of your, 70 to 80% of your calories at night. And the reason you use those massive amount of calories at night is to run the immune system. So as we lose our metabolism, as we lose key hormones, and as we lose the sympathetic drive, the immune system starts growing in size. It says, well, if I need 100,000 natural killer cells to go fight cancer and tumor cells that develop every day, okay, and it's not working, it'll start multiplying and make a million. You know, because it's, it, it, it wants to try to go in and defend the body, it doesn't have the energy or the substrates to do it, and so it starts expanding. And it keeps expanding, and at some point, uh, you end up dying, basically from such an aggressive, massive immune system. And we know this because January and February are the number one death months chronobiologically during the year. Uh, February is the number one suicide month. And this is across all countries. This isn't just here in France or in the US. The immune system is the most active in January and February. It also increases in size in January and February. Humans actually have somewhat of a hibernation cycle like other mammals. And so the reason that we have so many deaths in January and February is because the immune system gets extremely aggressive uh, and grows in size. So it's a, it's a lot of proof. The next thing is the immune system, we, what we see in autoimmune people is they generate a lot more free radicals. And we heard Dr. Harmon talk about you know, the theory of free radicals yesterday. And what we've seen is that you know, a lot of the research on free radical and reactive oxidative uh, species have come, we look, we say, well, the metabolism is doing all that. Uh, we get all these people in, and their metabolisms are horrible. I mean, they're in trouble. Yet they can generate free radicals 50 to 90 times upper limit norm on our blood and urine tests. So if their metabolism is horrible, I mean, just it's not happening, where is all these free radicals coming from? It's coming from the immune system. The immune system generates massive amounts of free radicals. That's how it kills bacteria, fungus, and pathogens. And, it, and as it, gets, it, it continues to become um, dysfunctional and increases in size, it generates unbelievable free radical damage. So we've taken some interesting tacks I'll show you on actually stimulating the metabolism, knowing metabolism and increasing mitochondria is going to generate more free radicals, but it actually helps to tone the immune system down and net we uh, get a net loss in free radicals. The next thing that happens is the GI tract increases in, <coughs> excuse me, the amount of flora and the amount of pathogens in the GI tract. And I'll show you in a minute that we believe the GI tract is actually the master endocrine gland to the whole immune system. Uh, and I'll show you why we believe that and why we think that's happening. But the, it's very interesting that as we lose key hormones and lose uh, sympathetic nervous system drive, 
the amount, these people continually have infections and we can't eradicate them. And then we finally realized that the candida albicans and the gram-negative rod bacteria is there stimulating the immune system. And we learned a lot of that from people that have uh, genetic defective type of diseases and they just have unbelievable amounts of gram-negative bacteria in their GI tract when we would try to eradicate it. We came close to killing some people before we realized that that stuff's there for a reason. Uh, obviously having a GI tract full of a lot of pathogenic bacteria that the body has purposely put there to stimulate the immune system uh, is the number one reason we get cancer in the GI tract. The next thing we see in autoimmune diseases is a, uh, there's a large increase in adipose or fat tissue. Fat is part of the immune system, and I'll show you that in a little bit. It actually is a direct part of the immune system. As we age, from the age of 30 on, we lose lean body mass or muscle, and the body continues to, to take the lean body mass and turn it into fat. The question is, why is it doing that? Fat is a very strong stimulator of the immune system. Okay, And the last thing we see is we lose what we call ATP, or ATPAs. It's basically enzyme dysfunction. There's some very important enzymes, and one of the largest ones is a sodium potassium pump enzyme. And, you know, we've always t been told to stay away from sodium. Well, in fact, sodium is critical for the body to be able to kill bacteria. It's critical for the body to be able to uptake uh, amino acids into muscle, amino acids into the immune system. So the, the, uh, the sodium potassium pump, which uses anywhere from 7 to 15 percent of your total energy, is critical. And we see a lot of dysfunction happening there. So on the decrease side, again, we see a loss of sympathetic drive, a huge loss in the mitochondrial ability to generate ATP. We see a loss of metabolic and anabolic hormones. We see a very large loss of digestive integrity. Circadian rhythms, if we look at biomarkers to aging, the number one and two biomarkers we see happening either in early onset aging, I tend to deal with people that are 28 to 45 years old. I don't have a lot of experience with children or geriatric patients. But what we see is these circadian rhythms flatten out. So instead of having these peaks and troughs modulating throughout the day, they become flat. And that is very linear as I've looked at the gerontology studies and some of the brilliant work that Dr. Dean and some of the other fine colleagues have done here. That is a big deal. And maintaining these rhythms really increases lifespan. And in the next one, the second most important is functional reserves. And what that means is the body has uh, five to seven years of reserves. It's like a battery that has lots of extra reserves in it. And as we age, we get into the disease process, we lose these functional reserves. And, and it's interesting, we'll see cancer victims that they seem to be doing pretty well, you know, on the chemotherapies and the various regimens they're using. And then all of a sudden, just like within a phase of three or four days, they'll die. It's like something happened. We finally identified that something is the immune systems continue to expand and take over the body and they lose functional reserves. There's no other reserves for key amino acids, key hormones the body can pull from to keep functioning and um, they die very quickly. So one of the things in, re in getting the disease under control uh, is you have to reestablish functional reserves and that takes many years. But if we stay on the right track through the right type of hormone therapy, they will eventually come back. And because without the functional reserves, you may start feeling better and then you go out and stress yourself and it'll pop you right back into the disease. And then the last thing we see is a large decrease in lean body mass, decrease in bone density, and a decrease in basal metabolic rate. The, immune, the lean body mass or muscle is also part of the immune system. Bone is part of the immune system. And obviously, as the immune system becomes active, it decreases your basal metabolic rate, which is, uh, this is your metabolism while you're sleeping. Again, 80, 70 to 80 percent of your uh, calories are burnt at night. So by watching the basal metabolism, we can tell what the immune system is doing. And that's very simple, because if the, as the immune system becomes active, it shuts down your aerobic metabolism. Chronic fatigue and narcolepsy and these type of diseases are just out of control. 
the number one thing that people look for when they come into a supplement store is energy type of supplements. What can I do to have more energy? And I tell them, quit working 20 hours a day. You know, just because I do it doesn't mean you should. You know? But what happens is the immune system will purposely shut off your Krebs cycle and purposely shuts off this metabolism. It can't work. The body doesn't have enough energy to f run the whole body at one time. It has to move energy around. So when the digestive tract is on, for example, it moves energy to the digestive tract, takes 20 to 30 percent of your total energy supply to run your digestive tract. It can't do other things. So as the immune system becomes uh, active, which is most active from 1 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning, it shuts your metabolism down. And so, and it starts, uh, for example, it uses calcium out of the bone. Osteoporosis is due to the immune system being active and literally sucking calcium out of the bone as part of the inflammation response. Uh, we see a lot of calcium supplement usage in the United States, and it's directly feeding inflammation because it's an amino-reactive protein. The second thing is women tend to have eight times the risk of autoimmune diseases as men. And I had a lady in my office a couple of weeks ago, and she says, you try putting up with my husband and see if you don't get multiple sclerosis, okay? You know, maybe that's it, I don't know. But we thought we could look at, you know, since women tend to be predisposed to uh, these diseases, what can we do as far as analyzing what happens to women to the, to the, when they go into these diseases? Uh, in the last 15 years, we've seen a large increase in men coming down with what has traditionally been women type of autoimmune diseases. So what do women have in, internally, biochemically, in their neural system, endocrine system, immune system, and gastrointestinal system that makes them prone, more prone to autoimmune diseases other than having to put up with men, okay? And, uh, Neurally, women have uh, larger amounts of dopamine than men. Dopamine is a very strong growth hormone agonist, or increases growth hormone. Uh, women do not have as much sympathetic drive, stimulant drive. The body makes the equivalent of amphetamines internally, as men do. As to their endocrine system, they obviously have more estrogen. Estrogen is an extremely powerful amino stimulant. Estrogen is one of the single biggest causes of autoimmune diseases when it gets out of control. Uh, they don't have the level of active thyroid that men do. They don't have the active level of testosterone that men do. And those two hormones are very key in controlling the immune system. They also have a much more aggressive adrenal axis than men. So their adrenals kick in a lot quicker Makes them, big, makes them more reactive sometimes than men. And the reason they have more adrenal uh, sensitivity, if you will, is because of their estrogen. Estrogen primes the adrenal glands and it makes them very sensitive. So men with low estrogen, many times they don't get this, you know, big kick in their adrenal glands that women do. And it's interesting, when we track this, women's estrogen levels stay high for 18 to 19 months after they've delivered to a baby, okay? And the reason it stays high, there's several reasons, but one of the reasons is to keep the, the adrenal glands primed. For any time that baby will cry, they'll immediately go into a stress response to, to get the needs to the baby. You know, men are over there sleeping on the couch and the baby's crying, they don't hear a thing, and the woman immediately jumps up and goes right to the baby. The reason for that is, is this es excess estrogen is, is priming the adrenal glands to this cry of the baby or the needs of the baby to protect the baby. After about 18, 19 months, estrogen starts coming down as the baby becomes more self-sufficient, can do things on their own, eat on their own, and what have you. So that's a prime example of how estrogen affects the adrenal glands. And what happens in women is they, as more women are working and more women are stressing themselves, they tend to dismodulate the adrenal glands, which then dismodulates the rest of the endocrine system, and boom, there we go. We've had a number of women after their first pregnancy go into some horrible autoimmune diseases. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis and their bones start fusing 13, 14 months after the pregnancy. 
women going to wheel, into wheelchairs at nine months with multiple sclerosis after pregnancy. And then what's happening is the hormones do not remodulate properly uh, after they deliver. And the next thing we know, we've got a major autoimmune disease on our hands. Um, and, and more and more women, for example, are not breastfeeding, and there's more and more cesarean births. And by that taking place, that is setting these women up for these big autoimmune diseases because the body does not get the proper signals from breastfeeding, for example, to remodulate these hormones that have just been wild for nine months. And by not having a vaginal delivery, the body doesn't get the signals uh, to remodulate these hormones and change the biochemistry back to a non-pregnancy stage. Women also have very uh, superior immune systems to men. One of, it, one of the reasons is because their adrenals are so much more aggressive. But women have much superior immune systems to men. Their immune systems are genetically set up to fight bacteria infections. So a, a man, for example, that will get bacterial blood poisoning, for example, sepsis, which is just out of control, rampant right now, unfortunately, uh, sepsis kills 72 to 75 percent of men, but only 26 to 28 percent of women. Why? Women have immune systems set up to fight bacteria. Men don't. Viral infections in women are extremely dangerous. Men have immune systems set up to fight viral in infections. Uh, so, for example, AIDS for a woman is extremely, extremely lethal. And we almost have to do a, a mild hormonal sex change internally to stop the AIDS from very quick death. Whereas men, because they do have predominance to fight that viral infections from their immune system, we don't have that, that we tend to do much better remodulating a male. Women's gastrointestinal tracts have a much higher level of bacteria floor than men's do. Part of that is because they have less metabolism, they have less of these hormones that generate cellular metabolism, and so their gastrointestinal tract takes up the slack, if you will, by having, by having more uh, bacteria floor in the GI tract, and they have more path potentially pathogenic floor in the GI tract, again, all to stimulate the immune system. Women have much higher rates of ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, and cancer of the colon for this specific reason. Um, and, you know, and, and the amount of, for example, vaginosis in the United States is you know, 25 million women. And the present approaches of taking a drug to try to stop it is making it worse. Um, so, they, they have a, they, so they have these predispositions, and we can learn by that, apply that out to the rest of the population, and come up with ways to uh, get some relief. As far as stopping autoimmune diseases, and neural, ND is neurodegenerative, and AI is autoimmune diseases, these are the things that we, we focus on. Obviously, a healthy lifestyle management is important. Um, I'm amazed at how Americans want to abuse their body, and, and, and good health is about 20th on the list after taking the garbage out. And, and, and they, they don't drive their car or keep their house up that way, but they really want to crucify their body. And then they don't understand why they got these diseases, and they want you to fix it immediately so they can make the party Friday night. Uh, I tend to find Europe, a lot of the Europeans I work with are a lot better about protecting their GI tract, their liver, and their kidneys than Americans. And uh, part of it's our lifestyle. Uh, the next thing is, uh, as far as stopping the diseases, is reestablish metabolic and hormonal balance, getting the basal metabolic rate back up. Uh, the next thing is reestablishing what's called the Krebs citric acid cycle that Dr. Dean talked about. And it actually has, it's a Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, there's something called a urea cycle, and there's something called a glutamic pool. And I know this gets a little technical, but we reestablish that functionality through just using some supplements I'll tell you about. Uh, the next thing is eradicating pathogens if you're sure they're a pathogen. And, that, and it, that's where we've had a lot of difficulties. These people will test very high for very pathogenic gram-negative bacteria, like Klebsiella pneumonia. Um, and we will eradicate those, and they'll get worse. And what we're finding is these Klebsiella or the Salmonella is there because it's trying to stimulate the immune system. 
we'll find a tremendous amount of candida albicans or yeast infections, which is just out of control. And the reason the candida is there, because candida is a normal inhabitant of both the mouth and the lower colon, is candida stimulates natural killer cell activity. And so as we see these candida infections, and we cannot eradicate them, we only learned how to stop them last year after about $10 million of research, we've realized the candida is there to stimulate cellular immune system and natural killer cells, which kills virus-infected cells, tumor cells, and cancer cells. So as we lose our metabolism, these bacteria pick up. The next thing is establishing GI integrity and health, establishing the circadian rhythms I told you about, and rebuilding functional reserves. This makes a nice presentation slide, but this is asking a lot, you know? <laughs> I mean, this isn't just a quick bullet, and I realize this is asking a lot, and I, again, the reason I'm showing you this is it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy process to reverse these diseases. As I wrote in the little presentation abstract to try to get some focus on, Chronic inflammation and autoimmunity actually, when the body loses metabolism, loses these key hormones, the body actually starts using inflammation for its normal day-to-day -day operations. It has these backup systems. It may not be a very good backup system, but it's going to try to keep you alive. And so as you lose your stimulant drive, you lose these hormones, your body literally reverts to a chronic inflammation response for normal day-to-day -day operations. And it starts generating very destructive fight or flight or stress response, neurotransmitters, hormones, and what have you, because it's trying to keep you alive, and it will. Uh, but it has some very serious long, longer-term effects by doing that. So reversing chronic inflammation you know, like saying, well, we, this person has high cortisol levels, so they just need some DHEA. They're living on cortisol. If they've lost their noradrenaline levels, uh, which is a natural process of aging, their body will start living on cortisol. If you stop the cortisol without correcting the stimulant drive, for example, they'll get worse. Uh, and this has been probably the biggest thing that we've found in looking at the whole body using these cell tests is the body is living on a chronic inflammation response. So it takes a little bit of a step process to get, re get it reestablished where it's living on the right system, if you will, uh, to get it to go better. The testing that we do is on this slide. And a lot of physicians get frustrated with this slide because it's not the type of testing you may be used to. Uh, we obviously do a very detailed history of the, the patient and look at their family history. What's interesting about autoimmune diseases is, is many times there will be nobody in the family that had Parkinson's or had multiple sclerosis or had lupus or had diabetes. And so a lot of times they will doubt that this person actually has this serious disease. They look good and their blood tests are normal. Uh, what we tend to find is there, may, there is actually another type of autoimmune disease. Again, they're all basically the same. They have a little different flavor. So, for example, we will find the mother suffered from depression, and the daughter, 20 years later, went into aggressive rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. And so we're looking at did they have any type of autoimmunity response going on? Uh, did, they, did they become diabetic during pregnancy? Because, again, the, the type of disease, as far as the name we'll put on it, can be one of a hundred. But they're all basically revolving around the same mechanism. So it's very close to look at if there's any type of autoimmunity. You know, was the father very attention deficit disorder, for example, which is an autoimmune disease. The next thing is to run a very good foundational chemistry or blood test just for the basic chemistry. And the IRP is immunoreactive proteins. These are just inflammation proteins. C-reactive protein, uh, for example, has been very uh, well documented in scientific research to cause obesity. Uh, it's been shown to cause diabetes, okay? So we look for basic inflammation markers uh, to see if, in fact, they are, have an increase in inflammation. We look at iron. Uh, there's a lot of people that say we shouldn't be taking iron, but, with, but without iron, you can't make internal stimulants. Uh, I've raised a lot of eyebrows that I'm, I use iron therapy, yet I've got Parkinson's. 
Uh, you can't generate uh, internal stimulants without oxidized iron. Uh, and what got our attention is we noticed people that would go anemic 15 years later, they get cancer. And we couldn't understand that. Well, they build ships out of iron. The body uses iron to break down tumor and cancer cells. Uh, and so iron is actually very important. The problem with iron is when it stays in an oxidized state and doesn't get reduced back due to the lack of ATP. So it's that lack of being, re you know, being taken back out of the oxidized state that's important. We look at 24-hour urine patterns with the urines acidic or alkaline. It's because urine uh, pH or the pH of the body is a very strong biomarker. The body has basically four circadian rhythms that we watch. One is cortisol, okay? The second is pH. The third is the sleep-wake cycle, okay? Um, and what's the fourth? Uh, temperature, body temperature. Uh, many of these autoimmune people come in and they're two degrees below normal on their temperature. Their blood pressure is always low, okay? Um, so those are four very strong rhythms in your body. And when they become altered, uh, whether we can find the disease or not, we know we've already got a problem, big problem, brewing. Uh, the next one is, is what we call a biometabolic profile. The best test for your money is putting uh, amino acids, which the body uses over, you know, 16 different, 1,600 different functions are based on your proteins in your body. Uh, and organic acids, it's very powerful to tell. It's like in racing engines, they take the oil out of the racing engine and they analyze the oil to see how the engine's been running, how it's broken down, what have you. It's the same kind of process. We analyze the... Uh, the blood and the urine to see what the body's been doing. Uh, looking at what's called red blood cell membranes. Again, we take some blood and we use the red blood, blood cell membrane fatty acids will tell you exactly what's going on. The body has fatty acids that covers the nerve sheathing, for example, and myelin sheathing. It has fatty acids that covers all red blood cells. As free radicals and disease start taking effect, it will radically alter this little membrane. And so we can tell exactly what type of fats you need to be on to slow this down. Fats or har act like hormones, and they have some very powerful effects. We also look at the, uh, the your, your hormones themselves, thyroid, adrenal, growth hormone, and your gonad hormones, for example, testosterone. And the largest m mistake I see being made is that we tend to want to look at total hormone levels which have no value. Uh, most of these hormones are bound, and they have, there's very, a very small fraction that's actually active. And so you have to be looking at the free fraction of these hormones. Uh, we've only in the last two months realized that a total, like total testosterone or total estrogen does have immuno uh, capabilities, but the whole game is in these free fractions. Uh, you, know, you only have one to two percent of your testosterone that actually is available to do things in the body. You have a very small percentage of your thyroid. So you can have all the total thyroid or testosterone or estrogen or progesterone you want, but if it's bound up, uh, you're getting no benefit from it. Um, a GI, running a full scope GI health panel, uh, as far as doing stool sample analysis, urine analysis, it's critically important. And one of the things we see in the United States is because uh, it's not an easy test and it can take up to 10 days to culture urine and stool samples, they don't want to do it anymore. They want some quick test and blow on. Uh, you, you, this is so critical to see what your GI tract's doing. Um, the, uh, the, and look, so it's GI tract health. The SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The top 10, per, the top uh, eight to ten inches of your small intestines is where all your protein assimilation takes place. If you have a bacterial infection there, uh, you'll never get better. And you won't know it a lot of times. You really feel pretty good. You, you, I have so many people go, well, I feel pretty good. But they're living off stress hormones instead of off what they should be. They feel good. Uh, the next thing is a permeability index. As the intestine starts getting more of these pathogenic bacteria, it becomes more permeable. So every time you eat, you're leaking toxins into your blood. 
and I'll have many, many people that say, well, I eat, and it just kills me. I mean, I get so fatigued after I eat. It's because the gut's become leaky. It's leaking these toxins um, into the bloodstream. And the last one is, is what we call immunal health. Uh, as far as running complete blood count, T and B cell subsets, and looking at this, what we call a CD4 to CD8 ratio, looking at what's called the phagocytosis index and the natural killer cell activity index. What does all this Greek mean, okay? What the whole, what we're realizing the whole game is, is to take hormones and, and substances to remodulate the immune system. And so when we look at what the values, for example, of free fraction hormones may be, um, we've had trouble a lot of times stabilizing people. Or we'd have to have very high levels or very low levels of these hormones for them to feel right. We never understood why. We're in the second phase of this 10-year research project tying out all substances, whether it's neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, hormones, or whatever, as far as the specific effect they have on the immune system. And this is where some real mileage is happening. So by watching the immune markers, you, you can titrate hormones, neurotransmitters, to see what effect they're having on the immune system, because this is the whole game. Uh, I don't know who came up with the idea that we're immunosuppressed, uh, but with 120 million people with autoimmune diseases, which the very definition is, the immune system's overly aggressive attacking the body. I don't think we need immunostimulants. What's, what's actually happening is the immune system is, does not have enough of the uh, precursors and metabolic drive to, to modulate properly. Uh, and so it starts dysfunctioning and getting aggressive by expanding. Uh, we do not find uh, at all that we need to be doing more immunostimulants. I've been a little shocked uh, some of the celebrities saying they, you know, they still do estrogen when they've had breast cancer to keep the immune system stimulated so it'll fight these things. And it's like, you know, this is the last thing we need. Estrogen is, is stimulating the immune system causing the breast cancer. We need to get the immune system to modulate better and do its job. So the CD4 to CD8 ratio in your lymphocytes is very, very important. That's another test that, it's a simple test, it's not expensive, and it will give you a lot of mileage because you have to understand whether the person is humoral biased in their immune system or they're cellular biased. Most of these autoimmune diseases are humoral biased or natural immunity of biased diseases. And so if we do things that affect natural killer cells or cellular immunity, um, when they're actually humoral biased, we make them worse. So it's very important to understand whether there, you've got a humoral biased problem. We, and like I said, 70 to 80% of autoimmune diseases, they have excess CD4 to CD8 ratio. We attack that. Women, for example, have, because their immune system is, is superior to men, they have a much higher level of what's called innate immunity. Um, and this is, this is the phagocytosis in natural killer cells. So, and it's interesting, like the phagocytosis, which goes in to kill bacteria and eat up bacteria, its highest levels are from one to four o'clock in the morning. Your, your cellular immunity, which goes in and kills virus, cancer, and tumor cells, its highest activity is from four to eight o'clock in the morning. And so you can see that if your immune system's active during the day, I mean, these are the maximum times of sleep your body temperature is supposed to be the lowest of its whole day at three o'clock in the morning. It gets very low, uh, you go into REM sleep because this cellular immune system kicks in and it uses some real nuclear bombs to go clean out cancer and tumor cells. And it doesn't want your body active, it doesn't want your nerves moving around. You have the lowest amount of stimulants for the whole day at three o'clock in the morning. It does not want movement while it's in there killing a lot of bad guys using some very powerful chemicals. So by telling which way the immune system's slanting, you can titrate your protocol to that. Um, make sure I'm not gonna run over in time here. Um, I'm gonna skip this. What we've tended to find is the, the, the standard thing we see with the central nervous system is it basically, it's a, your, your hypothalamus generates releasing hormones, it stimulates the pituitary, 
like see the hypothalamus generates stimulating hormones, but stimulates the pituitary to generate uh, releasing hormones, and that stimulates the end glands to make estrogen, testosterone, or whatever. And so we've always, for example, you know, in the thyroid, wanted to look at thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH levels. Well, what we keep coming across is the TH, TSH levels have no resemblance to the output of T3 or T4, the two thyroid hormones, and we never can understand this. Medical books say they probably have a pituitary tumor. What's actually happening is, is that those releasing hormones and stimulating hormones have their own unique properties to the immune system. And so they don't just, they're not just there to stimulate target endocrine gland production. They're also there to stimulate the immune system. They have their own unique properties. So we're starting to find out that particularly your pituitary releasing hormones, they have their own unique uh, reasons for stimulating the immune system. And they stimulate different parts of the immune system that have nothing to do with the, the actual uh, thyroid production levels. And it's interesting to note in cancer victims, we're finding large buildup of these releasing hormones. And the, what we've re learned is these releasing hormones are actually growth factors. And so as we, in breast cancer, we find a large buildup of different types of pituitary releasing hormones in these breast tissues, never could understand it. And in fact, in fact they, are, they are very powerful growth factors. And so in the last year, we've actually, for example, using thyroid, have been suppressing uh, TSH, and it's been producing some very strong benefits. And TSH, if we look at when it's most active, it's again at night during this heavy immune system stimulation. So we've started to realize these uh, pituitary and hypothalamus hormones have some very unique immune properties that previously we have not understood. Um, the immune system itself, when we talk about the immune system, we, you know, we've all had our lessons in immunology. It's actually a lot larger and more complex than what, what we've initially thought. Uh, the gastrointestinal tract has a number of, of factors and flora, intestinal bacteria, that stimulates and now realizes is actually controlling the immune system. The immune system itself obviously has humoral and cellular type of cells. It's not one big immune system. It's, it has different pieces to it, and they do very different functions. Um, and it's interesting that the, the cellular part of the immune system is what kills viral cancer and tumor cells, yet the humoral side of the immune system um, kills bacteria, fungus, parasites, and they both can't be working at the same time. So if your body has bacterial infection and the immune system is over here trying to fight that, it's leaving you vulnerable for viral tumor and cancer cell proliferation. It can't do both at the same time. It switches back and forth. And that's a very simplistic example. Nobody in the world understands the immune system. It is so, um, I mean, we just now understand inter endocrinology well enough we can make some meaningful gains. And, and, and endocrinology is extremely complicated. This bit about we can just take a hormone here and there, it's, it's not that easy. But it is pale in comparison to the complication of the immune system. We will never understand it. It's just, it is unbelievably complex. The next thing, the immune system, as far as component, is hormones. They directly affect the immune system. The next part of the immune system is, in fact, this uh, autonomic nervous system. We see as people lose their, uh, their stimulant or sympathetic drive, uh, their immune system becomes three to ten times more reactive to any type of challenge. Why? It doesn't have this tone to hold it down. So we find as people lose their internal stimulants, for example, uh, antibody production to a particular foreign antigen uh, can go up four to five times in that response. It gets very, very aggressive. Uh, the next thing that controls the immune system is, in fact, the mitochondria ATP generation in the body. Uh, the next thing that is part of the immune system is lean body mass, adipose tissue, skin, and bone. It's amazing when somebody has a GI infection, the first thing I see is their skin goes bad. And, you, I, and the reason is skin is part of the immune response. Melanocytes in skin directly participate in the immune response. Adipose tissue, as I told you, generates cytokines, which is immune-reactive proteins the immune system uses 
to go kill bad guys. The, immune, the adipose tissue is also a very prolific generator of estrogen. So I've had runway models, for example, that something happens and they've picked up as much as 100 pounds of weight in a year and a half. They've lived on, they've lived on diuretics and they've lived on stimulants so long that when they either get off of them or their body finally breaks, they go into unbelievable weight gains. Why? They broke down their, their hormones and their sympathetic drive. The body has to have something to stimulate the immune system. It uses adipose tissue to uh, generate more cytokines, and they just, it's unbelievable the weight they start putting on. And the last thing that affects the immune system is what's called NAD and NADH. Okay, and that's basically vitamin B3 type of enzyme. Um, and this one's important. Um, so anyway, you can see that the immune system has a lot of components to it. And so what we've tried to refocus on is what can we do to modulate these components to get this immune system doing its job properly and to slow down the growth of the immune system we see in aging uh, and go from there. Let me talk a little bit about, about NAD. I remember when I first met Dr. Dean many years back, and I had the honor of meeting him. He's just an outstanding individual. We were talking a little bit about my Parkinson's SDS and what I was doing for it, and, and back then I was still groping for answers to stop a very quick death. And he goes, well, half jokingly, he goes, well, you know, uh, smokers and drinkers and coffee drinkers have the lowest amount of Parkinson's of any of the groups. I said, yeah. So I immediately started smoking and drinking and drinking coffee. I, I thought, you know, I may not cure the disease, but sure I'm going to have a good time at least, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, then I, and, you know, he kind of said it half jokingly, but it was true. It was that uh, uh, here, you know, we've been told that drinking coffee and, and, and alcohol and smoking was so very bad for your health. And we ha our database scans over 1,200 medical libraries worldwide, so we just, it's no problem to get access to the best data in the world. There's a lot of intelligent people out there, and we like to take benefit of that intelligence. And sure enough, the highest rate of Parkinson's was in farmers because of pesticide exposure. And the lowest rate was in people that were light smokers, drinkers, and caffeine users. And this really intrigued me. And so the long story short was that nicotine is the precursor to basically vitamin B3, oxidized nicotine. Nic nicotine is a precursor to this NAD enzyme, which is a vital enzyme for making your Krebs cycle work. And Dr. Dean yesterday showed a, si a slide of the Krebs cycle that showed NAD out there a number of places. I was going to have him put it in here, and we just couldn't do it this morning. And what we see is the body will develop too much of what's called NADH, which is very immunostimulative. We see this in alcoholics. You know, if they drink too much alcohol, the body starts having to generate bacteria. Uh, pathogenic bacteria to detox the alcohol, and they build up too much of this, this substance called NADH and not enough of NAD. NADH causes your body to become anaerobic. It's very high at night when your immune system's active, whereas NAD is supposed to be high during the day, and that's getting your Krebs cycle to work properly and it's creating energy. And so we have been just totally... Uh, unbelieved about how small doses of pharmaceutical grade sublingual nicotine has just unbelievable effects. And we're using anywhere from two to four milligrams a day. I mean, very small dosages. The reason nicotine is so highly addictive is it's a very powerful chemical. 50 milligrams of nicotine at one time will kill you. 50 milligrams of amphetamines will give you a pretty good buzz, but it won't hurt you. Nicotine is very, very powerful. And what we've found in nicotine is it's also extremely trophic to nerve fibers. And so here's something, it, it has no carcinogenic features whatsoever. It is the burning of the tobacco leaves that produces all the carcinogen. But pharmaceutical grade nicotine, which is now over the counter in America, all the kids are trying to use it to lose weight, uh, is, has, uh, we've just been shocked at the properties that it has. Um, and the science is well backed as far as published science about, again, the use of low amounts of nicotine. And it's been amazing how small amounts, you know, two or even four milligrams a week will stop Tourette's syndrome in children, uh, stop ulcerative colitis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. It's just shocking that it will stop and slow down a number of autoimmune diseases. 
Well, one of the things I wanted to show you in this slide, and then we'll move on, is when the, when the body takes protein and, and glucose, it can either push it down and push it in this Krebs cycle that makes 95% of your energy through what's called glycolysis. So it can either go down, make energy, provide fuel for your ATP generation, or it can go out through what's called the pentose pathway to stimulate the immune system. And this pentose pathway, which goes through what's called a G6 phosphatase enzyme, generates no energy, physical aerobic energy. It stimulates the immune system. What we find in every single case of over the 800 we've dealt with in autoimmune diseases is they have what we call a partitioning problem. The glucose is not going down to the Krebs cycle. Fuels are not going down. They're going out to the immune system. And the number one thing you'll know that's happening, you start craving carbohydrates. Because the immune system uses the two main things it uses is glutamine, which is an amino acid, and it uses glucose. And if you start getting low, in, for example, in glutamine, it starts becoming over-reliant on glucose to fire the immune system, and you will crave carbs like you can't believe. So it's been demonstrated in alcoholics that crave carbohydrates, for example, that glutamine stops that craving. It doesn't take much, three or four grams a day of glutamine. So what happens is, is the immune system and uses the same fuels that the mitochondria or energy producing cycle for your ATP uses. And so what happens is the immune system steals all these fuels. We, in many of these diseases, we see a, what's called a, a down regulation of mitochondrial complex one and complex two. Uh, the reason, and for example, in Parkinson's, they always have a deficiency in complex one mitochondria, uh, which uses something called alpha ketoglutaric acid. And they have a deficiency in this before they ever use dopamine or seminet. Uh, they even have a worse deficiency after they start dopamine because dopamine just kills this C1, this complex one mitochondrial drive. We don't use dopamine in Parkinson's. And we've got a lot of interesting uh, eyebrows raised over that. Dopamine is really, I don't know, I've been very disappointed that they use dopamine so much. I mean, when they, they discovered dopamine, the science was very, very well published that Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, most of these autoimmune people, they're low in dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin. And Dr. Dean, for example, showed that as we age, we get low in catecholamines and higher in serotonin. So the data was real clear. They were low on all three of these substances, but they picked dopamine because it got a result. They used a high enough amount of dopamine, it started working. Unfortunately, uh, three to five years, years later, it totally destroys you. Why? Because its purpose is cut off this mitochondria drive. You don't have enough ATP to support your central nervous system and these neurons, and they start dying big time. Um, this is what happens as your immune system becomes more active. It's stealing your glucose. It's taking your pyruvate, which is very critical, turning it into lactic acid. It's taking your triglycerides, which always go up in autoimmune disease, and breaking them down to get at the glycerol, which triglycerides is one part glycerol and three parts fatty acids. You end up with all these fatty acids in your bloodstream, which causes fatty livers and, and all sorts of problems. It steals these key amines in your Krebs cycle, citric acid, aspartic acid, alpha ketoglutaric acid, the AKG, and, glut and glutamic acid. And it's interesting, for example, in multiple sclerosis, they have a, an above average level of glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is a very neurotoxic acid. And, and so they came out with a drug to block glutamic acid. Well, that's great, but glutamic acid is very vital in the immune function, and the immune system is using it. The answer for multiple sclerosis is to stop the pathogen that's caused the immune system to go to this glutamic acid and utilize it. And there's always a pathogen driving uh, this response that we find. And the next thing is that the immune system steals your glutamine and what's called alanine. These are just two amino acids. But if we look at what, what's taking place, your body has no ability to store proteins except in muscle. And we started realizing in AIDS victims that we could get lean body mass on them by using testosterone, they started living. We didn't know why, it started working. Of course, people go, well, sure, if you give them amphetamines and testosterone, they can live for a while, and then you kill them. It, it, they weren't dying, they were getting better. 
we end up, when we look at kinetics analysis on the muscle, uh, which is fun doing uh, biopsies of the muscle, we found the body was going after the glutamine and alanine in some unbelievable rates. So it broke down the whole muscle just to get at these two key amino acids. What did we do? We started supplementing those amino acids, 5, 10, 15 grams a day. When you get into a trauma for major surgery, your body, your immune system can use up to 25 grams of glutamine a day. Your muscles only store, we think, around 52 to 53 grams of glutamine. So you can see very quickly you can get into a huge deficiency on glutamine. And the problem is the immune system has to be ready to go at all times. So if you don't have adequate glucose and glutamine in your blood supply, we all get our standard blood test and they test for glucose. They don't test for glutamine. We test for both in the bloodstream. They both have to be at high levels. Why? Because those are immune primers. And so when you eat chicken yesterday and it may have had something in it, which it didn't, or whatever, you, get, you eat something that has a bacterial pathogen, the immune system has to immediately kick in and go take care of that problem. If you don't have adequate glucose and you don't have particularly adequate glutamine, it doesn't have these fuels to kick in. So it has to go, okay, well, wait a minute, let me go break down some muscle here, and then that'll give me the glutamine and alanine I need, and then I'll kick it in. Well, it takes it's a lot of time and a lot of metabolism to tear down your muscle. Okay, and when I see people go on these fad weight loss programs, they don't understand they lose more muscle than they lose fat. AIDS victims who waste horribly, cancer victims who waste horribly, horribly, even though they may only be down to 80 pounds, if we look at what's going on, they have higher percentage of fat to muscle than they did when they started the wasting disease. Okay, so, so taking uh, alanine and glutamine is uh, it's unbelievable for keeping your immune system primed. So this is what's basically happening, is that the immune system starts stealing all these vital substrates to feed this massive response. It also, at the very bottom here, it purposely starts shutting down your, your active thyroid, T3, uh, your DHEA, and your testosterone. It, it shuts those down so it can get very aggressive, okay? because T3, DHEA, testosterone, this SNS, the systemic nervous system, is what helps hold the immune system down, helps it to modulate properly. So if it gets uh, cancer cells and it wants to get aggressive, it will shut all these down. That's the proper response, but it's supposed to be a short-term response. It's supposed to go and shut them down, do its job, turn them back on. It gets in there, tries to do its job, it doesn't have enough metabolism, it can't do it, and you basically get stuck in this response. And it's that sticking in this response that causes all the autoimmune diseases over time. The gastrointestinal, let's just, we'll talk about the gastrointestinal tract a minute. This is one of these organs that, how many people have been to a gastrointestinal seminar? Anybody? Oh, we got one back here. Anybody else? Two? Probably less than 1% of the room. It's, it's one of these organs that just doesn't get any respect. It's kind of like that Rodney Dangerfield, you know, guy. Uh, and I've always been fascinated by it because it's so massive. I mean, it's, you know, the digestive system end to end is almost 30 feet long. And the, the primary definition of what it does is it digests food. And I know that digesting food is a complicated process and breaking down all the food sources to, to feed the mitochondria and immune system is a complicated process. But, you know, the medical textbooks say the adrenal glands, which are half the size of our thumb, produce almost 200 different types of hormones. You know, so we've got this little bitty gland that does all this. Why does it take this massive 30-foot monster just to digest food? The small intestines are 21 to 22 feet. It's interesting that uh, when you die, they grow to 27 to 28 feet. They take a massive amount of noradrenaline to make them work properly. As we age, we lose noradrenaline. It's the single largest thing that we lose as we age is noradrenaline. So the second thing that, you know, and we were doing a lot, we do a lot of neuroendocrine therapy. It was working, but there was just some sleeping monster that kept disrupting the hormone balance all the time. They were just, we never could keep them stable. And we were doing the stool samples, and, and we were doing the digestive permanent, permanent permeability samples, and all the things we knew, 
and, and we would find pathogens and do all the things to eradicate them. Everybody would be using a little bit of stomach acid because as we age, we lose our stomach acid. There was still something there. And what was interesting was these amino acid and organic acid tests that I told you are so you know, great and are not that expensive would come back. And even though these people were wasting, uh, they were not digesting proteins, fats, or carbohydrates. All three of them were coming back showing total malabsorption. Uh, yet here these people were wasting, they were hungry all the time. It made no sense. We finally realized that the epithelial cells of the GI tract, uh, they do two things. One is they, they absorb food through these epithelial cells, but they also are key components of the immune system. And what we found was that when the immune system has to do its job, these epithelial cells start signaling the immune system and stop digesting food. And we thought, oh, gee, this GI tract's doing more than just food. And we've come to realize that the GI tract, the lower part of the stomach and the upper part of what's called the duodenum, or the small intestines, is a master gland controlling the immune system. And how we stumbled onto that was that we started seeing a number of neurodegenerative disease patients, which luckily we got a good start on that. I've got some 20-year-olds with Parkinson's that were lead athletes, and they put so much stress on their body, they literally fry their, their neural system. And we, we started noticing that these, these athletes had really bad lower GI, lower stomach, and upper GI infections. And then our group in Japan in Kyoto came back and found that Helicobacter pylori, which is totally an epidemic gram-negative stomach pathogen, and an upper small intestine overgrowth of bacteria will cause neural disease almost every time. And we thought, how can this happen? Well, the next thing, when we started looking to GI tract, we found very large uh, amounts of dopamine in the lower part of the stomach. And not only there's a lot of receptors there, it generates very large amounts of dopamine. And it does that to shut off your stomach acid and shut off your GI tract after you've eaten. So in Parkinson's victims that are clearly low in dopamine, uh, like the geriatric Parkinson's, most early onset Parkinson's have too much dopamine, uh, their GI tract doesn't work at all. Uh, the single largest side effect of taking Seminet or taking dopamine is bacterial infections. So do, the body uses dopamine at the very lower base of the stomach to, to shut off the digestion and then and keep the stomach separate because it's so uh, acidic um, and keep it away from the small intestines. We also found, I'll try this pointer here, down right in this area, the cecum, and the ileum and right where it hooks into the colon is also, we found, is a, a basically an endocrine gland controlling the immune system there. And we see this in autistic children. They have a lot of ascending colon problems. We see this in, you know, colitis. And what we've discovered was that this area here and this area right where the stomach hooks into the small intestines, not a very good picture, are actually controlling the immune system and they're talking to each other all the time. So as food comes down the GI tract, this is doing all this immunomanagement work. It stops doing that, starts digesting food. Well, this takes over, okay? And then as the food comes down and it stops the absorption and it gets down to here, then this takes over and this stops. And it's interesting if we look at the neurobiology, there is direct uh, neurotransmitter pathways from the GI tract to the brain. It's very well established that the brain, that the GI tract is a second brain to the body. In Western medicine, we like to think that our brain controls the body. It's just human emotion to think that, you know, we can control our body. Eastern doctor in medicine believes that the GI tract controls the body. We're starting to think that the Chinese thousands of years ago actually were right. And, and the more we look at, the more we realize, and it's very well established that it is clearly a second brain, we're now thinking it's the primary brain. And this would help us understand why we've got such an epidemic uh, with autoimmune diseases. I mean, we dump drugs down the GI tract, we dump inappropriate food, we're stressing it all the time, it gets very little consideration medically. We don't understand the GI tract, it is, it is, it's very complicated. 
but and as we look at the GI track, it is a, it, the way it was designed, it looks very much like the brain and how it's designed. And the GI tract has its own central nervous system called the enteric nervous system. And while it works with the peripheral and central nervous system, it has a large degree of autonomy. Uh, and it's interesting, after death, it will still, that nervous system still works for 24 hours after death. So, and you, know, you see very little science about what we can do to control the enteric nervous system. The number one thing is noradrenaline to control the, to control the nervous system. The other thing we've noticed is that all the neural transmitter and, uh, and receptors and hormone receptors in the brain are in the GI tract. We also found that all the neuropeptide receptors in the brain are in the GI tract. We further, uh, and there's very good published science, are now realizing the GI tract is in fact producing most of the neurotransmitters and hormones for the whole body, not the brain, not the ovaries, and whatever. It's well established that the GI tract produces 90% of your serotonin. Uh, it's well established that since serotonin is a precursor to melatonin, the GI tract produces the largest amount of melatonin. While the penile gland seems to give it uh, tone and circadian rhythms, we, when we find people with uh, diseases of the GI tract, they have very high melatonin levels. Even the, they have afternoon levels that are stratospheric when it's supposed to be almost non-existent. And we never understood that. We further have found, we always thought that hormones were the strongest biochemical messengers in the body, and that's why they work so well. But we found that, in fact, they're not. We found that immunoreactive proteins are actually more powerful than hormones. And we also found the most powerful substances as neuropeptides. And so we think that the real keys to stopping these diseases is controlling neuropeptides. And what we find is that in a classic marker of genetic obesity, for example, is opiates. And we find excess opiates in their blood. We also find excess something called neurotension in their blood. These are both neuropeptides that we thought the brain was generating. We now find the largest uh, source of generation of those two peptides is these two areas I showed you in the GI tract, the stomach and the cecum area where that appendix is located. And it's interesting in autoimmune diseases that a lot of people at some point in their life lost an appendix or tonsils. And traditional medical uh, thought process is we don't need those two organs. They were something we needed back when we were walked on all fours or something. The appendix is a very, very significant lymphatic gland. And without an append it signals uh, the immune system throughout the body. And what we found is these people that lose their appendix, and it's usually due to excess humoral response when they're young, they can't generate enough what's called SI, uh, and they can't generate enough what's called IgA, which is a type of, uh, let me get over that what's called secretatory IgA. And so what we find is the appendix is there, one, to keep the small intestines and the colon apart from each other. The bacteria that's in the small intestines does not belong in the colon and vice versa. And without an appendix there to, gen to, to generate immunoreactive proteins to, to kill bacteria and things that are trying to flow through there, uh, if you don't have your appendix, you're compromised for the rest of your life. And there's some things you need to do. If you don't have your tonsils, I mean, I would really probably cut off a few of my fingers to have my tonsils back. You, without tonsils, you do not have a proper lymphatic function in your mouth to fight bacteria at all. Uh, and so excess bacteria gets into your stomach, and we also found the tonsils signal the stomach as far as what the stomach needs to do to disinfect things if it can't, in fact, do it in the oral cavity. The, this uh, SIGA, uh, for the physicians here is, is, again, one of the best things to test for in an autoimmune person or somebody that just has fatigue or just doesn't seem to be functioning right. Uh, it is the single largest uh, immunodeficiency disease out there. It's estimated between 1 in 400 and 1 in 500 people have an SIGA uh, deficiency. We find about 1 out of 20 autoimmune disease people have this. Uh, I've got it. And what we see happening was in the United States in the 50s and early 60s, breastfeeding got at its lowest level in the last century. 
The doctors also didn't like the women picking up more than 20 pounds of weight on pregnancies. So we, had, we saw a lot of low uh, weights of women during that time. And what we found is there's been, a, if you don't breastfeed, these, these children do not get a full immune system because they get all these antigens from the milk. It's in the mother's breast. And so what we found is the lack of breastfeeding and also the low body weight where they just sometimes could not develop breast milk. Uh, these, we've got all these baby boomers after World War II that were born did not get, uh, did not get IgA levels. Without IgA is the single most important immunogoblin for your mucosal immunity in your whole GI tract. It's the passive immune system. So, that, so you can see from this slide right here, you can see how much SIGA is in the GI tract compared to other cells, okay? So this is what gives your mucosal immunity passive immune system. And the whole key is to have lots of passive immune system and not active. As you lose your passive immune system, which is a natural byproduct of aging, you, uh, your immune system becomes more active. And an active immune system is very, very destructive. It uses nuclear bombs, for example. The passive immune system uses rifles. To, to fight, to specifically fight bacteria. Uh, glutamine is very powerful for increasing uh, IgA levels, along with testosterone and T3 is very powerful for increasing it. So we see a lot of IgA deficiencies, and it's something to concentrate on. I'm running a little behind, so I'm going to push through here. The next thing, this shows the, this is the stomach. And it generates it generates called PG2, prostaglandins, which are inflammatories, histamine, which is inflammatory, acetylcholine, which is inflammatory, CAMP, which is inflammatory, calcium, which is inflammatory, and actually potassium. When potassium is over sodium, it's inflammatory to digest food. Okay, it'll digest it one way, it'll try one way or the other. So what's happened in all these people that have stomachs that hurt is they've got an inflammation response going on to, for this digestion to kick in. It doesn't have the metabolism to do it anymore, and it starts using inflammatories. So, you know, so if anything, what these people need, they don't need to suppress acid. They need to take some betaine hydrochloride stomach acid pills, which are very benign, easy to use, and everybody past 40 uh, for the most part. And it's amazing. I'll give these pills to people, and their stomachs are killing them, and I don't tell them what it is. I tell them it's an acid suppressant, and immediately their stomach gets better. And I've, what I've been giving them is actually straight stomach acid, just these little, with, with pepsin in it. So one of the things we're seeing is as the stomach starts dysfunctioning and it starts using these very high inflammatories as a backup system to try to digest food. Uh, obviously, that's not a good situation long term because you'll get cancer eventually. Um, I talked about the neuropeptides, so I'm going to skip that. but. Again, the biggest problem we see right now and where we think the best gains are going to be made is in controlling neural tension, opiate peptides, uh, neuropeptide Y, and what's called substance P. Opiates peptides has got our interest because um, if you didn't have internal opiates, you would not be able to get out of bed. You'd be so sore in the morning because the, the cellular immune system is so destructive when it goes in and do, does its work. So these opiate peptides are generated between 4 and 6 in the morning to basically heal yourself up. But what we found is, as I showed you in this last slide, if you don't have enough metabolism, the GI tract doesn't work right. It starts using inflammation responses, and so the GI tract gets very damaged. And most of that damage we're finding is occurring at night. We now realize the GI tract is controlling the immune system, so it will really damage itself trying to get the immune system to work better at night. So what happens is the, uh, the body generates these opiates, neurotension, and dopamine to try to repair the GI tract throughout the day. And they're classic biomarkers for obesity and all neurodegenerative diseases. We find problems with these opiates. The GI tract took all this damage, it's, so it's the body's generating these internal opiates to try to stop it. It's interesting that, that, that pain pills, very strong pain pills, tranquilizers, and sedatives have just skyrocketed out of control as far as prescriptions in the last 10 years. Yeah, that's what's happening. The inflammation is just over, it can't, the body can't generate enough of these neuropeptides to do it. The problem is these neuropeptides will totally derange your, uh, 
your um, endocrine system. Um, bacterial and fungal endotoxins is also uh, probably one of the biggest things we see causing autoimmune diseases. Again, I told you the body will generate these for reasons, but the other situation is if you're not generating enough stomach acid, uh, these bacterial and, uh, and fungals will get in there. And, the, the, and what's in there, and, and these are causing 95% of the autoimmune diseases, not viruses. There may be a virus underlying it, we think, but we are always seeing bacterial fungal infections causing these autoimmune diseases. We've already been able to prove it for Parkinson's and MS. And the problem with bacteria and fungus is it's very, very sticky. So it sticks to these cell walls. We've found it, and I mean, the, the science is becoming very clear about it causing heart disease. Uh, and they're so sticky that it, they, they, it's hard for the body to break these things off. The epithelial cells, for example, which inflammation of epithelial cells causes, we believe, 90% of all cancers, and that's been well published. And so it's hard to break these things off there. And so they get very sticky. They use up all your Krebs cycle substrates to feed on. You should never dump amino acids down your GI tract if you've not tested to make sure you don't have pathogens down there because it will feed them. Candida loves glutamine and alanine, and so does Helicobacter pylori. A lot of these bacteria are, are anaerobic. They run exactly the reverse of the Krebs cycle. So obviously, they're going to make you feel pretty bad as they're actually running reverse of the Krebs cycle. And, it's, and also, the bacterial fungal endotoxins greatly increase cell death over time because they're eating up all the substrates for ATP, and there's not enough energy to support them. Um, the largest pathogen that we really have isolated on is what's called Helicobacter pylori. And I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but this is one bad pathogen. And it is basically epidemic coming through the poultry supply. The government has gotten uh, pretty strict on trying to get salmonella out of control with chicken and turkey. Uh, unfortunately, salmonella is coming through our produce supply, but they've done nothing about Helicobacter pylori. Uh, it gets down, so you eat these things, and, and, and it gets down underneath in this mucosal layer underneath here and infects actually underneath the main lining of the stomach. It does that to protect itself from stomach acid. Helicobacter pylori uh, is a class one carcinogen. It's been implicated in 99% of all GI cancers. It, we, it has also been highly implement, in, in, implemented in all neurodegenerative diseases and autoimmune diseases. We find 60 to 70 percent infection rates in all neurodegenerative cases with Helicobacter pylori. And the reason is it's disrupting this whole etiology of the stomach. It, it gets right in here is where it, where it inhabits. We've realized that this area to this area is a major control gland to the immune system. It disrupts this whole area. It allows stomach acid to get into this area that's supposed to be highly alkaline starts tearing this up. This area right here is what digests all your proteins, and the next thing you know, you start getting big dismodulation. Um, right now, there's such a massive infection of Helicobacter pylori, that's the reason that antacids or acid suppressors is the number one and three drug in the United States. In a recent study, it showed that physicians, uh, when people came in with stomach problems, 95% of the times they gave them an acid suppressant. It is the very worst thing you could ever do. It, it, an acid suppressant keeps your stomach pH at about a 5 instead of a 1, and every time you eat, eat, you're asking for a serious bacterial infection, and you'll never know it. The, the problem is the, the protocol to eradicate Helicobacter is no fun. It's a chemo protocol of three antibiotics and an acid suppressor, and it's not a lot of fun. And so because it tends to be a little severe, uh, and it's a 10-day to two-week protocol that can be disruptive to work, they won't prescribe it. But, but if, if I, we found one bacterium that does a tremendous amount of damage, this is it. And so we tell people that the protocol is, is not any fun. And clearly you have to rehab your GI tract with acidophilus afterwards, but it's a class one carcinogen, so maybe two weeks of inconvenience and a tough little protocol or, or, you know, will, will be worth the extra effort. This is just basically everything that Helicobacter pylori will do. And I'll skip that, but it causes a large amount of cytokine generation. Cytokines are immunoreactive proteins that the, that the immune system uses to kill bad guys. 
it's something that's supposed to be turned on and then turned off. You get into chronic cytokine stimulation with this bacteria. So if you've not, if you have a little stomach problems, you're doing acid suppressors, or you, you just don't seem to digest meals very well, uh, you definitely need to check for Helicobacter pylori. And they've come out with a breath test for Helicobacter that is, does not use radioactive isotopes. We do not like using radioactive isotopes. Uh, the serum factors uh, are not that good because this bacteria is inside the stomach lining. A lot of times you won't test uh, positive uh, using antibody assays. But luckily there is a good breath test that you can do for it. It's real easy. You just drink this pudding looking stuff and, it, and then you exhale later and it tells you whether you've got it. It's a very good test. Uh, let me wrap up here. The next thing is immunostimulants. Um, serotonin, histamine, acetylcholine, calcium, and dopamine are all very powerful immunostimulants. Uh, we seem predisposed to put people on antidepressants and increase serotonin, yet the medical literature has been clear for 20 years. Serotonin is one of the, the five strongest immunostimulants in the body. As Dr. Dean pointed out yesterday, we've become more serotonin biased as we age. Um, the answer is not to increase serotonin in our mind. The answer is to increase your catecholamines, noradrenaline, the big one. Um, histamine, okay. Uh, what I didn't tell you in the GI tract is uh, people with asthma and allergies have high levels of what's called IgE or immunoglobulin E. The single largest source of IgE receptors is in the upper part of the small intestines. So if they're getting food allergies every time they eat, and this is the single largest area of IgE. And what happens is if you don't have this IgA giving you this passive immunity, the body starts using IgE, IgM, and some of these other immunoglobulins, which are much more destructive to try to, to counterbalance the problem. And so uh, histamine is a very powerful immunostimulant. Uh, we use a small amount of antihistamine and acetylcholines in all our protocols. As you get a histamine response, it will shut down your metabolism. Uh, it's interesting that one of the over-the-counter sleep aids uh, in the United States that everybody uses is an, actually an old Parkinson's drug from way back that inhibits histamine acetylcholine. It says to use 50 milligrams to go to sleep. We use maybe 5 or 10 milligrams. And it's amazing. Your allergy response will go away and you'll start feeling better. One, it stops this inflammation the response, and then it uh, helps your metabolism to restabilize. Now, on the other cytokine side, interleukin-6, uh, 1, 6, tumor necrosis factor A, and interferon Y or G. They're all tremendous stimulants. And what we find is interleukin-1 and particularly in tumor necrosis factor A are always, always high in autoimmune diseases and neurodegenerative diseases. They're always high in wasting diseases. You usually die of cancer from wasting, not from the cancer. You usually die of wasting from AIDS. These are always high. And so by driving these back down, where they're not so aggressive, as you lose your stimulant drive, these numbers become high. Uh, it provides benefits. and. Um, and um, anti-aging purposes. I'll pass this one. I've already told you the immune system expands as we get older. Uh, and this slide just demonstrates that we get more pro-inflammatory cytokines as we age. Um, trying to make the point that we don't need to be using immune stimulants. This particular slide shows you that as it's just this is just a chronobiology of a fever response, basically, or infection. But what's interesting is it, when you come from the incubation period up to where the illness really starts kicking in, I'd like you to notice that as you get into this illness response, it increases secretion of cortisol and growth hormone, secretion of, of basically acute phase response proteins. You become carbohydrate intolerant. It seems like every carbohydrate you eat, it pushes it into fat cells. And you become increasingly dependent on carbohydrates for fuel. A lot of alcoholics have this problem. They didn't want to be alcoholics. Their immune system, they've got something eating on them. Okay? They've got a GI infection. They didn't get a good GI tract from their mother. It's interesting to note that the 100% of your mitochondrial DNA only comes from your mother. Okay? So I could have an athlete whose father was Ben-Hur and had 10 gold medals, but it was mother 
with somewhat of a couch potato, depressive, lethargic, that athlete will never be good, or they'll use so many drugs they'll kill themselves. You get all your DNA mitochondria only from your mother. So if your mother tends to have certain types of little problems, irritable bowel syndrome or whatever, doesn't seem to have good energy, you got that same set, okay? And so I think it's, you know, we talk about insulin resistant carbohydrate intolerance. This is what's causing it. It's this immune system being active. Okay, let me skip over here and then we'll break for lunch. This slide on the oxidative stress just shows you that I talked about NADH a while ago. This NADH, NADH oxidase enzyme, it's what uh, is generated during this humoral immunity that's fighting bacterial pathogens. It generates unbelievable levels of free radical damage. Okay, it's, it's, this is where it's, it's coming from. It's what we found out. Not actually coming from the mitochondria on the free radical damage. It's coming from either this NADP oxidase enzyme or it's coming from this enzyme right here, which unfortunately caffeine stimulates this enzyme right here, okay? And this is where we're seeing all the free radical damage come from the immune system. This slide here that I want to point out, one of the reasons we've got an epidemic with autoimmune diseases is we're taking the, all these uh, non-inflammatory uh, drugs. You've heard of these COX inhibitors, COX pathway 2 inhibitors have come out. They're blocking this pathway right here. What it does is it overfeeds this, what's called this lipooxygenase pathway. This pathway is specifically identified as upregulated in asthma, diabetes, many serious autoimmune diseases. So as we take these anti-inflammatories, it's blocking this pathway and it's, over, and it's causing this arachidonic acid to go down this pathway. Well, why did they have us taking all these non-inflammatories? This pathway causes pain. This one doesn't. This one causes horrible degenerative diseases. So they block the pain because Patient's got pain, we want to stop that. Uh, the deal is to block it up here using thyroid straight T3 hormone, uh, fish oil, two grams a day. There's something called curcumin, which is an Indian Ayurvedic herb. It's very effective. It blocks the enzyme right here before it can go down these pathways. Uh, none of our uh, autoimmune disease people and neurogenerative people do we have on any kind of non-inflammatory uh, products, and this is the reason why. We talked a little bit about the hormones. Let me get right into this one because I'm running over. We use T3 very heavily. T3 is always deficient in 99% uh, of our autoimmune diseases. Um, T3 is, has unbelievable properties for enhancing your mitochondria. It's, it's very anti-cancer. It's very anti-inflammatory. The GI tract uses it in massive amounts to repair the GI tract. It's with the mitochondrial stomach being so high, it greatly helps digestion. Uh, a little bit of T3 before you eat is amazing. It has all, it's, a, it's great for priming the immune system. And what we found uh, is that we tend to, a lot of the physicians tend to want to prescribe natural thyroid hormones, which are T4 and T3. We're finding buildup of T4 in cancer cells. So T4 operates very different than T3, and we're actually suppressing T4 using small amounts of T3. I'm talking 20 to 40 micrograms a day is all. It's very powerful. And, and, and what we find is that, that the thyroid is not converting T4 to T3 like it should be. So we find a massive amount of subclinical euthyroid 6 syndrome going on. They're not getting enough T3. The body is trying to protect the muscles from being torn down because of this immune response, but in, and it's stuck in the response. So 20 to 50 micrograms of T3, and this year we learned by suppressing, actually suppressing TSH and T4, these people are getting better, and we're not seeing the cancer mutations. It's just one of those wild things that happen, but we realize that both T4 and TSH are very immunostimulative, and they stimulate cancer proliferation. The next thing is testosterone. You know, we've been told that testosterone's bad and the athletes abuse us and, you know, we'll grow, women will grow mustaches and all these bad things. And it was basically banned in the U.S. until the last couple of years. Well, it's interesting that this is uh, out of Dr. Dean's book. This is, it's interesting that testosterone is highest 
from 1 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning. So if it's so bad for us, why is testosterone the highest when our immune system's the highest? Okay? And what we see is in people with the disease or older people, they don't get this huge, from about 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the morning, you get a massive increase in testosterone. They don't get this increase. Their immune system then is overactive because it's not modulated. And what's the classic thing we see as we age? We can't sleep. Past 2 or 3 o'clock, we can't sleep. The immune system is overactive. The testosterone is, is not holding down the immune system, but also both the humoral immune system and the cellular immune system use testosterone to modulate properly, to develop immune reactive proteins and develop cellular uh, immune system. So it is vital that we have adequate levels of hormones, and your hormones are highest usually at night. They modulate the immune system. Uh, we use transdermal gels for this reason. A little transdermal testosterone before you go to bed. If you wake up at 3 in the morning can't sleep, a little transdermal testosterone. It's amazing how it puts you back to sleep because testosterone for the rest of the day drops down to very low levels. And so by taking a bolus long-term injection of testosterone and pellet, it doesn't modulate properly. So the transdermal creams are really the way to go in our opinion. Uh, they're very inexpensive. They do take some testing. But it is vital that we have adequate androgens uh, during, the, uh, during the night. The, the next one is aromatase enzymes. The body, as you get into an infection or you age, you tend to aromatize more of your androstene dione and testosterone to estrogen. Estrogen is a horrible immunostimulative. Our standard, all our standard protocols, everybody is on an aromatase inhibitor. We use Arimidex. Uh, and it's very important that you block this estrogen as we age because it is an unbelievable immunostimulant. I've been on estrogen blockers for four years. They're very benign. They have very, very low of, of negligible side effects. It's kind of strange that a man would be on estrogen blockers, but they really, really work. Um, and they, it's, again, uh, a quarter to half a milligram uh, a week is plenty. This slide, all this does is show you that growth hormone, uh, most of the hormones kind of fluctuate up and down along a, an average. Growth hormone doesn't, and we've got a brilliant speaker this afternoon on growth hormone, so I'm not going to talk about it. What's interesting about growth hormone is either low levels or it's really spiked up. It's not one of these hormones that fluctuates and has a little bump and goes along. What we see in autoimmune diseases is because the growth hormone is trying to repair the loss of the organs, it stays too high over time. So we purposely antagonize growth hormone by using something called yohimbine which was an aphrodisiac drug, but it blocks the receptor to settle growth hormone down. If you get tired in the afternoon and you just get so fatigued, it's usually due to growth hormone. I've had a lot of physicians that are using growth hormone say, man, I take that stuff and I sleep for days. I said, that's what kids do when they're young and grow. They get these big spurts of growth hormone, makes them sleep for days. Growth hormone has some unbelievable properties, and, and our speaker this afternoon is going to share those with you but it can also be a two-headed monster. Uh, and the last thing in finishing up, and I apologize for running late, these are some of the things that, you, that we use uh, to settle the immune system down uh, to the neural drive. Um, A1 agonists, you have re adrenal receptors, ephedrine, or what's called mitodrine. What's it called, Phil? Is it mitofilin? Yeah, what is it called? Yeah, this is, uh, IS sells this. It's expensive, but it's very, very good drug. What happens is you become, uh, you get too much of A2 receptors, and A2 receptors feed your immune response, makes you fatter than fat, and you can't get your fat down. So what we do is we actually use, the, it's called mitodrine in the United States. It's a specific A1 inhibitor. It's a French drug, uh, or we use ephedrine and, and uh, go that route for people that can't afford it. And we also use this yohimbine which is an aphrodisiac drug, but it blocks this receptor. These two are really, really important because if you try to use a stimulant, uh, it will just keep increasing these A2 receptors, so you have to block it. This A2 receptor also increases growth hormone. Okay, so if people maybe do need growth hormone, you don't want to do this. Uh, the next thing is, is increasing the dopamine and noradrenaline conversion. The single largest thing you use is, is uh, noradrenaline as you age. So you can use a reuptake limiter. Unfortunately, it's called dexedrine. 
Dexedrine is considered a dirty drug, but it's an amphetamine, but 10 to 15 milligrams of dexedrine is very anti-aging. Why? It gets this dopamine converting to noradrenaline. Dopamine's a feel-good drug, but it's also a monster. Uh, the last thing I talked about was nicotine, two to four milligrams. If you're not a smoker, okay, two to four milligrams a day is plenty. I started, you know, at two milligrams a day, and it was plenty. Very powerful. Paracetam, which uh, I think has been talked about, is an excellent drug. We're using only eight to 1,500 milligrams. The higher doses makes it act like a totally different drug. At the lower doses, it helps release dopamine up into noradrenaline. It also is very good about stabilizing calcium. Calcium is a very powerful immunostimulant. Paracetam at 800 to 1,500 milligrams settles it down. If you stack paracetam with nicotine and T3, unbelievable anti-inflammatory properties. You won't ever get sore again and your body will work right. GABA uh, is something that's made from glutamine. Two to three grams at night, just under your tongue before you go to bed. Keeps your nerves settled down so you can sleep. And tarring. And then the last thing is anti-serotonin drugs. You know, we see more problems with excess serotonin, so anything you can do to actually lower serotonin and increase your catecholamines, you'll get a lot of mileage out of. That's my presentation. I do greatly apologize for running over, and I've greatly enjoyed being with you. Thank you.